You may be seated. Let me just kind of echo what Brett said there. I do hope that a lot of you will come out tonight. You know, we've got this whole group of people that comes on Sunday night. And, you know, if we don't find ways to intentionally be together, you know, we can just find ourselves, you know, in a group of people that we don't know. And so we do want to foster community, and we've got to be intentional about that. You know, like Brett said, you know, not even his sermons are good enough to foster community. What's actually even more astounding is that not even my sermons are, are great enough. That's really astounding. But I hope you guys will come out tonight. As Brett mentioned, we're starting a new series today. We've entitled it um, A Higher Calling or The Higher Calling. And, you know, one of the things we say all the time in here is that, you know, God is intentional um, about your life, that, that God, God cares about your life. And, and as big as he is, as, as gigantic as he is, he cares about even the little details um, of your life. And in fact, he even has a calling on your life. And so in this series, we want to really unpack that. And we want to examine that. And most of all, what I hope that you get out of this series is that you take that seriously. You take seriously the idea that the creator of the universe cares about your life and even has a calling on it. And so to do that, we want to look in Scripture. We're going to look at a passage today where, where God called someone uh, into ministry it's in the Old Testament. It's in uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, and the 19th verse. And this is here in this passage of Scripture, we see where Elisha, the prophet Elisha, is called to, to become um, a prophet of Israel. And some of you, you know that story. You know that Elisha first, Elisha, <laughs> Elisha first became the servant of Elijah, the prophet of Israel. Um, and, and then he became a prophet uh, himself. So let's look at that passage of Scripture. Again, uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, starting with the 19th verse. And here's what it says. It, so it says, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his auction, oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elisha replied. What have I done to you? Now let me stop there because there's... Take some explanation there. There's, you know, a ton of stuff that is glazed over there. I mean, you know, the, the Hebrew scriptures there um, are talking to an audience that would have kind of understood what was going on. But for us, we may miss a lot of that. So first, let me just say that, that when Elijah, when he came and he found Elisha, it says that he threw his cloak over him. That's important. If you have a King James, uh, King James Version, it'll probably say that he placed his mantle upon him. And that's important because in those days when a prophet, a prophet of Israel would go to someone and they would take the skirt of their cloak, they would wrap it around someone, that was like a ceremony or a tradition to say the same prophetic gift that has been given to me um, as a prophet to Israel is now laid upon you. In other words, this was Elijah basically saying to Elisha with this movement, with this action of throwing the skirt of his cloak around him, he was saying, you know what, you are going to be a prophet of Israel. You know, and this was just an amazing thing. And so that's why you see, you know, Elisha, he runs after Elijah and says, let me kiss my mother, my father and mother goodbye, you know, and then I'll follow you. And then Elijah says something kind of interesting. He says, go back. He says, what have I done to you? In other words, what he was saying is, you know what? You know, I might, it might have been my hands that threw this cloak around you, but what has been done to you has been done to you by God. So understand that this really, you know, don't, is, don't look at me. Don't look at me, okay? What, this God has done this thing to you, so whatever you do from here on out, know that you're doing it as unto God, you know? And so that's what he was saying to him. Now, I want to point something out to you. <clears throat> Nowhere in these passages of Scripture, no place is there anything that signifies that Elisha was somehow worthy of this honor. There was nothing to suggest that he had any particular talent or gift. There was nothing to suggest 
that uh, he was particularly noble or righteous. There was nothing to suggest that anywhere in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, what we see from the scriptures is that he's just an ordinary guy. He's a farmer. Okay? He's just sort of plowing. He's plowing this field behind these oxen. That's what he's doing. He probably, more than likely, you know, his parents probably owned the land, and they had probably given him a portion of the land, you know, to their son, and he, and he had the ox, and he worked the land, and he made a living off of the land. He's just a farmer. That's all he was, you know? Let me say to you that this is not um, untypical of Scripture. This, this, is, this is exactly what we see throughout Scripture. All throughout Scripture, we see God calling people who are filled with character flaws. We see him calling people who are filled with weakness. We see him calling people who, who, seem, who seem utterly incompetent for the task at hand. Who seems that there's just no way that this person is going to be able to do what God's calling to do. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is simply this is that God doesn't need your abilities to accomplish something. He doesn't need your skills or talent to accomplish something. What he desires is the relationship that will ensue when you have responded to the calling. That's what he desires. And so that should be very encouraging to all of you weak, incompetent people. You know, it should be very encouraging to you because he doesn't need, there are no qualifications with God, okay? You're not filling out an application. You're not giving a resume that says, hey, this makes me qualified. As a matter of fact, you know, if, if God's modus operandi in Scripture is to be fulfilled most of the time, probably what makes you more suited for the job is if your resume makes you look like a fool. If, you're, if you are completely unqualified, you're more likely to be called to the task that way. You know, so this is what God does. And so I just want to say to you that just as, as Elijah walked up to Elisha and the mantle of God was placed on Elisha, and that was the ceremony of that day, let me tell you that the same kind of ceremony has already taken place in your life. It took place the day that you accepted Christ as your Savior. That day, the mantle of God was placed on your shoulders. That day, God called you to something higher and better and greater. And it doesn't matter what station in life that you're in. It doesn't matter how incompetent you might feel to the task. It doesn't matter about your weaknesses or your character flaws. The fact is, is that God doesn't need any of those things. God desires the relationship that ensues from you responding to the call. And God has called you to greater things in your life. That mantle rests on your shoulders right now. The only thing that you need to have as a qualifier is exactly what we see in Elisha. What did Elisha do? When the mantle was placed over him, it says that he chased after, he ran after Elijah. The only thing that God really wants is that the desire in your heart is to respond to that calling. That you want that calling. That you want the thing, the higher thing that he's called you to. You want that more than the mediocrity that the world would offer instead. That's exactly where we see Elisha was. But what's it going to take to respond to that call? What's it going to take for you to respond to that call? It's not outward things. It's not abilities and skills. It's not that. It's something inside. It's the desire and the faith to believe. Listen, the faith to believe that the thing that God is calling you to is greater than the thing he's calling you from. You just have to believe that. Now, let me say that, you know, we look here at, at Elisha, and you would think, you know, it's probably not hard for Elisha to, to believe that. You know, I mean, here he is, day in and day out, plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. If, that, if we understand that correctly, what that means is, is that a yoke, you know, yokes the two oxen together, and 12 of them would mean 24 oxen, basically. So, so 12 pairs of two all in front of him, pulling these plows, going through this field. And so get this now. This is Elisha's life. Every day, getting up, 
staring at the backside of oxen. That was his job every day. Pastor Brett wanted to, to entitle this sermon, Asses and Oxen. I told him that would be inappropriate. <laughs> I said I couldn't say that from the stage. So here he is. And by the way, um, if you've ever seen an ox, an ox is a huge animal, okay? Um, it's bigger than a horse. Um, a, an ox typically will weigh around 1,600 to 2,000 pounds. A, a, a horse is usually around 1,200 pounds. But ox do the same thing that horses do with regard to using the bathroom. They'll just walk along and they lift their tail and out it comes, you know? And when there's 24 of them in front of you, if you ever go on a horseback ride, go horseback riding, the, often that horse will go to the bathroom two or three times while you're riding him, okay? So now multiply that by 24. Okay, this is in a two-hour ride. Multiply that by 24 now. So you're behind these oxen, all right? They're going, they're going to the bathroom, and the oxen behind them are stepping on it and plowing over it. So you're just, the smell is wonderful, you know? You're just plowing behind that field, and, and the oxen are just plowing along, going to the bathroom, and the stench would be, you know, oh, yeah. And there you are, every, and talk about monotony, monotony. I mean, this is worse than working on the line at a factory doing this. I mean, you're just standing behind these ox every day. The most excitement you get is when you make a turn, you know, and you're just plowing behind these ox every day. Talk about monotony. And I think that you could easily, you could easily call that almost the definition of mediocrity. Just doing the same thing every day. So you can imagine, yeah, Elisha kind of wanted out of that. But let, before we go too far here, let's point something else out here too. Elisha had a good income from this. Elisha was in no danger of going hungry. He was financially probably better off than most of the people in the surrounding region. He had, he had 24 oxen that he owned plus the plow equipment. In those days, you were wealthy if you had that much. Not wealthy, but you, you had something. You had a means of survival. And herein is the secret. Here's something I want to share with you. Here's the thing about mediocrity. It offers security. There is security in mediocrity. And so very often, if you're going to respond to God's calling in your life, God's calling you to something greater, something better, something bigger. But the only way to grab something bigger and greater, the only way to embrace that is to let go of the thing that's holding you back. Now for some people, some people for, even in here and Sunday night, some of, if, for some of you it's just really bad decisions you're making in life, some dysfunctional ways that you're living, dysfunctional toxic relationships that you're in and you keep staying in those kind of relationships that are just destroying your life and keeping you from the thing that what God would call you to, you've got to learn to let go of those things. You're going to have to let go of them. But for many people, it's not, it's not destructive decisions that they make. Please understand. I want you to see this. It's not destructive decisions. It's just mediocre decisions. Someone once said that that he believed that most Christians, most Christians are not in danger of destroying their lives. They're just in danger of wasting them. They're just in danger of wasting them. You have to let go of the security of mediocrity. Look with me. Look at what Elisha did. It says this. It says in verse 21, So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. You see what Elisha did? And by, you know, I mean, this is over the top, right? Right? I mean, he, burn, he kills the oxen, he slaughters all of his oxen, and then he even takes the plowing equipment and breaks it apart and uses it for firewood to cook the meat. Okay, so that would be kind of like if you owned a business 
and you had, you know, a van of, or a business vehicle and, and you had some other physical resources and you decide, you know what, God's calling me to something else. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to sell the van and make the money from it. I'm going to torch the van. I'm going to destroy my computer equipment. You know, and that's one thing about people in the Bible, especially the ones who are responding to God's call. They're always doing these over-the-top things. Aren't they? They are. They're always doing these crazy over-the-top things. And this is what Elisha was doing. He was going back and he's saying, you know what? I'm intentionally burning my bridges. I'm intentionally burning them. I'm not going to go back to this. I'm killing the oxen. I'm, I'm destroying my plowing equipment. I am not going back to this. And see, the problem is, is for so many of us, we want to do something better. We want to do something greater. And maybe, you know, if you're a Christian, you've even sensed God's calling in your life to do something better, to do something greater. But the problem is, is it, it just seems so insecure. It seems like there's no promise of fulfillment. And you've got this secure thing that you're holding on to. So we try and do this thing where we're double-minded. And we say, you know what? I'm going to kind of hold on to this. And I'm going to test the waters over here to see if this is going to work out for me. That's what I'm going to do. Let me tell you. You know the old hymn? The cross before me. The world behind me. Jesus said in the gospel, he said, he, talking of people who would follow him, he used this analogy. He said, he who takes hold of the plow and looks back is unworthy of the kingdom of God. Those are tough words. But what he's saying is, is you can't hold on to security. You can't hold on to the world's way. You can't hold on to the things that are making you comfortable while at the same time trying to embrace something that is great and wonderful and spectacular. And it is this great thing, this wonderful thing, this spectacular calling. Is there a promise of some particular kind of fulfillment? No, there's not. There's not. But let me tell you, there will never be a time when you will be worse off for shooting for the stars. There's never going to be a time when you're worse off. I had a student once who, who wanted to go into the space program. And uh, you know, because they're going to send this manned mission to Mars, and she was waffling on it. And, and I said to her, her actually, it's uh, this girl, she's the, um, she's the daughter of Pastor Larry Bauckham at Suncoast Community Church. And I said to her, <clears throat> I said, she was talking about all the possibilities and, you know, what if this goes wrong? I said, yeah, but think of it this way, Stacy. What if the first human being to step foot on the planet Mars is a woman? And her name is Stacy Bauckham. You know, and here's the thing. What do we think happens, you know, if, and I said this to her, I said, what do you think happens if you strive to get into the space program? You get the grades you need, you do everything you're supposed to do, you get into the space program, you know, you go through all the process and the rigorous training and everything, and then at the end, you know what, you get cut and you don't get to go out into space. I asked her, how do you think that's going to look on a resume? I was in the United States space program, but I got cut and didn't get to go to Mars. Is that going to hurt her on her resume? Come on. I mean, striving for that which is greater never hurts you. It never hurts you. But let me tell you that the possible fulfillment, the thing that you're shooting for is so wonderful and so great, and the whole thing is, is God's doing something in you that's great no matter what. No matter what seems to be fulfilled, God's doing something in you that is great. But you have to be daring. You have to say, you know what, I'm going to let go of security, and I'm going to shoot for what seems impossible. Some of you remember the Apollo programs, you know, this, speaking of the space program, you remember the Apollo missions and everything. What you might not remember is that the decision to go to the moon was a hotly, hotly debated one. There were a lot of people who were against it, and they were against it, frankly, I mean, for good reason. Here's why. When Kennedy announced that he wanted someone to go to the moon, that he said, his words were, I believe that we should set ourselves the goal of sending a man to the, in this decade, before the end of this decade, to sending a man to the moon and returning him back to Earth safely, scientists in the United States, their jaws hit the ground. 
because he was proposing something that frankly he had no idea of the technical difficulties and he was proposing something that seemed insanely impossible. And today, when we think about our space program, we think of it as being routine. Let me tell you that our space program is nothing but routine. Nothing but routine. To give you an example of this, let me tell you what it's like. Imagine if you want to have some fun sometime, go over to somebody's house, and one of you stand in the backyard with a rock, and the other stand in the front yard with a tennis ball, and yell at the same time, and both of you throw the rock and the tennis ball over the house and try and get the rock and the tennis ball to hit each other over the top of the house. That's what we do every time we launch the shuttle and go to the space station. Every time. Okay, it is nothing but routine. It is very, very difficult. And back in the 60s, it seemed impossible. It seemed impossible. The re-entry angle, the re-entry angle was so sharp that it's less than the width of a piece of paper. You go in too steep, you burn up. You go in too shallow, you bounce off into space, and you can't get back. It, the, the tasks seem enormous. And so it was debated. At Rice University, John F. Kennedy gave a speech, and he said this. He said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because it is that goal which will serve to measure and marshal in us the best of our energies and skills. And we are unwilling to postpone it. In other words, what he was saying was, look, when you strive to do something great, it's in the very striving that you're changed, that you're transformed. And let me say to you that... When he announced that, the United States then put together uh, the National Aeronautics Space Agency, NASA. And in that time, in the last whatever it's been now, 50 some odd years, NASA has done things for this nation. Its worth is incalculable. There was a study done at Princeton about five years ago that pointed out and discovered that for every dollar, for every budgetary dollar that was put into the, to the NASA, to into the space program, for every dollar put into it, NASA pumped about $8 back into the United States economy because of the things that it invented and the things that it discovered through its technology. That is one of the best decisions that this country has ever made. And what was it? It was a decision to do something that looked impossible. So let me say to you that you're going to have to want it. You're going to have to want that greater thing. You're going to have to strive for it. And some of us begin that journey. We start that journey, but we're still, we get this holding on to the, to the world here, back here. Holding on to that which is secure. As long as you hold on to that which is secure, there will always be the temptation. As long as you don't, bla as long as you don't burn the plow and slaughter the oxen, there's always going to be the temptation when things get too hard here to go back to the plow and go back to the oxen and to go back to the stink of your previous life. <clears throat> I used to work with horses. I used to work in stables. I've been riding most of my adult life, and I had this job once working in these stables, these were expensive horses, by the way. <clears throat> and a horse is a, it's a dumb animal. It really is. If you put a horse in, in a, a pasture and you teach it that it can't get out, you can lower the fence to where it's only this high. And a horse that on other occasions will jump eight-foot barriers when it's in that pasture will think it can't jump over that two-foot high fence. And so often I would take these horses out uh, because I had to clean their stalls and everything, and, and I would put them in this particular pasture. And one day there was, I was cleaning a stall, and these horses were in this pasture. And this one horse, he's frolicking around, and, and he's playing, and, and sometimes they'll kind of jump, you know, uh, when, they're, when they're playing with other horses. And he's right next to the fence, and he sort of did this whinny, and he kind of jumped up a little bit. And he turned, and when he turned, his front hooves landed on the other side of that fence. That freaked him out. Okay? He lost his mind. Yeah! He did, you know, started bunking, and he bucked. And when he bucked, he turned his butt, and then his hind legs landed on the outside of the fence. And he looked at that fence with this, this look of shock and awe on his face. 
this horse reared up and whinnied and took off like a bolt of lightning across that farm. He was running all uh, that he was running all over that ranch, and all the other horses were freaking out. It was like it was a prison break, you know? All the horses had their, their heads out the stalls. <laughs> oh, he's out, look, he's out! You know? He's running, look, how did he get free? And he's running all over the place, you know? And this is a fifty thousand dollar horse, you know. And so people are freaking out. Now here's the thing: over at the edge of the ranch, it was in Orlando, Florida, it's called the Red Redbug Ranch. And over there, there's this big gate. The gate was open. Okay, and and if the horse went out that gate and into the forest out on the other side of that gate, the red bug area, there is about a hundred and fifty thousand acres of forest just on the other side of Red Bull Road. If that horse had gotten out, it might have been days or weeks before they could have captured that horse, a $50,000 horse, and who knows what kinds of injuries it would have sustained, who knows what kind of, you know, whatever, whatever it would have done. And, and the biggest thing is, is now their, their mind has changed. They've changed their, that's how a horse is. If you change things on it, if it had, all of a sudden it'll never go back to doing what you had it doing before. And so everybody was freaking out. What are we going to do? This horse is running like crazy. 1,200 pound, big old horse. Now the funny thing about horse people is they all think they know everything. They do. They all, horse people think they know everything about horses. And so they're all, they're all almost off this horse, you know. So the horse, and you get in front of the horse, and sometimes if you get in front of the horse and wave, you'll spook it and it'll stop, you know. Not this horse. <laughs> this, and I tried it. I tried it. Here the horse was running, and I got in front of it. I was going, oh, oh, I was waving my arms, you know. And, you know, the horse is just galloping, boy, full speed. And I'm telling myself, just stay here. He'll stop. About the time he was 40 feet away from me, I changed my mind. I said, he's not going to stop. And I got out of the way, okay? Um, and so the horse, and everybody's trying, to, everybody's trying to get this horse to stop. Nobody could stop this horse. A 200-pound man cannot stop a 1,200-pound horse that is pound for pound three times stronger than him. No way to stop this horse. The horse ran out by the gate and it was standing right at the edge of the open gate. This horse had its freedom. But there was a trailer where, on the property where this old guy lived and He'd been dealing with horses his whole life. He nonchalantly, I didn't say that right, nonchalantly, walked out of the trailer. He walked into the barn. And he came out the other side of the barn. And he had something in his hand. A big orange bucket. The feed bucket. And he just walked to the edge of the barn. And he held the bucket up. And the horse trotted right back into his arms and right back into captivity. Here's the kicker. The feed bucket was empty. If you're operating with the power of God, you're like a stallion that the world can't stop. But if the old devil comes along and he holds up that feed bucket, the security of being taken care of, the security of your stall, many of us trot right back to an empty feed bucket. You just got to decide that you're going to live and respond to God's call. And in the process, do this insane thing where you let go of the security that all the conventional wisdom of your culture and your society and everyone around you says is security. All the characters of the Bible did these over-the-top things you got to decide whether you're going to be an over-the-top Christian. Let me end with this last thing. You make that decision, 
If you make the decision to let go of the security of the world behind you, to head for the adventure and the calling of the cross before you, if you make that decision, let me say to you that it might not be. In fact, there's a very good chance that it won't be a change. It won't be a change so much in what you're doing as it will be a change in how you do it. The passion with which you do it. The purpose with which you do it. And when you change what's on the inside, when you change your passions and your motivations and your purposes, let me tell you, you might be doing the same things but you will be having an entirely different experience. You do understand, don't you, that the guy who decides to work late when his boss asks him, and he does it because he's motivated to do so because he wants to make his co-worker look bad because he doesn't like his co-worker, and the guy who says, I'll work late for my boss because he believes in the company and because he thinks it's going, doing good things for people, that those two people, they both decide to work late for the boss, but they have two entirely different experiences. You do understand that, don't you? And when you decide to start following after and responding to God's call, much of it will be deciding to live life on purpose and with intentionality that has a different motivation and a different purpose. And when you do that, you will begin to experience life completely differently. I heard a story once about this woman who was married to a man who, by all accounts, was just nothing but an old ogre. He had this list of chores for her to do. And he was just a taskmaster. He had to have those chores done every day at the right time. His dinner needed to be ready at a certain time. He was always very particular about how his food was made. His laundry always had to be done. The house needed to be made just right. He could never be embarrassed by somebody coming over in the house not looking spotless. He had all of these things. And he even gave his wife these lists of things to get done. And if she fell short or she didn't get something done, he would berate her and be just verbally abusive to her. And she was miserable in her marriage to this man. Well, one day a miracle happened. He dropped dead of a heart attack. Those kind of guys usually do, actually. The studies have shown uptight people, eh, they don't live long. But so he's dead. A couple years went by. <clears throat> she married another guy. Married. He married another guy. This guy was diametrically 180 degrees different from the first guy. This guy just acted like to be in her presence, was to be in the presence of paradise. He worshipped the ground she walked on. He would have never dreamed of berating her because she didn't have dinner ready on time or she didn't get laundry done on time or she didn't do it the way he thought it should be done. He would never dream of doing that. He loved her and showered her with affection and care every single day of his life. And she was so much happier in her life. One day when he was at work, she was doing housework and, and she was in the closet and she was cleaning up an old closet and she was going through some old items that she had and and as she was going through those items, she came across the list that her old husband had for her. And she picked up the list, and, and she went over and she sat down on the bed, and as she looked at that list, she just began to cry. Because she was so thankful that she wasn't living in that world anymore. And there was a part of her that felt some guilt that she was happy, but she was happy that she wasn't living in that world anymore and that her life was so much different. She remembered how cruel her former husband had been to her and what a taskmaster he had, he had been. And she was just weeping as she was sitting here looking at this list on the edge of the bed. And then she noticed something peculiar, something that caught her eye. As she was sitting on the bed near the end of the day looking at this list that her former husband used to have for her, she realized that that day she had already done everything on that list for her new husband. You see the difference, right? The difference is, is that when we're responding because we've been loved, which is what God does for us. 
when we're responding to that and we have different motivations, when we're living life with different motivations, it is not necessarily that what we're doing is different. It is that we have a different perspective on it. And how much you want to bet that the cleaning and the cooking and the care that she gave to her new husband, how much you want to bet it was superior to the cleaning and the cooking and the care that she had ever given to the old husband? How much you want to bet? Of course it was. Let me say that that's what God, <laughs> that's what God calls us to. He calls us to a life of glory and beauty and wonder and adventure. And is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. Is it scary? Yeah, it's scary. Does it mean letting go of the security of your past? Yeah, it means that. But it also means living a life that is filled with beauty that you can't get holding on to the security and the mediocrity of the world. You weren't called to a life of mediocrity. Now, if I can get you to believe that one thing and to spend the rest of your life railing against mediocrity and striving to do great things, then I can go to my grave in peace. I don't know that I've convinced you, but that's what I'm going to try and do. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, please teach us that, that the mantle of God is on all of us. In the age of grace, in the new covenant, Lord, basically all of us have been called to your service. We all have a higher calling, Lord. And in your economy, there's no one that has to live a life of mediocrity. All of us can change our motivations. All of us can, can let go of the things that are holding us back, Lord. We don't have to be afraid to let go of the security that only the world offers and Lord, it offers it tacitly. Lord, help us to see that the security that we believe in that comes with the mediocrity of this world, Lord, help us to see that it's not really security anyway. That in any, at any moment, the things that we think of that give us security and comfort can be taken away in a moment, Lord. Lord, help us to have enough wisdom to see that. Lord, as long as that's true, as long as, as the treasures of this life can be corrupted with rust and, and thieves can steal it, Lord. As long as that is true, then why shouldn't we seek the things of heaven? Which are scary and frightening. But Lord, in the end, offer more security than we could ever have from the things of the world. Lord, help us to see that when we strive to respond to the great call that you have on our lives, that we will experience life differently no matter how the circumstances turn out, no matter how far we get in accomplishing this task or that task as we achieve or we try to achieve great things, no matter how far we get in those things, Lord, we will experience life differently. We will experience living it to the full, Lord because we'll have chosen to leave mediocrity behind and to embrace greatness, Lord. Help us to believe, each one of us individually and as a church, that we're called to greatness. And let us strive for it, Lord, with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our strength. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Amen.